August 3rd, news and questions. Topic number one, a clinical trial with 50 volunteers for a universal mRNA-based flu shot has begun at the NIAID's Vaccine Research Center. So researchers hoping that this shot will be more effective and longer lasting. Now, this is the same technology, of course, that's been used during the pandemic, you know, and I still have a lot of unanswered questions and concerns here, but, you know, the companies are very gung-ho to roll this out. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna are certainly uh, in to uh, adapt or adopt this new technology in their new shots. Um, traditional shots, of course, are based on either a weakened virus or a dead virus. That's what we've been using for many, many years, and I'm a lot more comfortable with that. And this will continue at least for this season, because this will not be available probably until next year or later. Who knows? Um, here's one thing about that. Anyway, if you're planning to get a flu shot, so I've been getting a flu shot my whole family for the last five years, mostly because of my kids. I mean, I haven't done the flu shots before. I'm still not so sure if I really need it. but. I want it to be a good example for them. And for children, they can have a worse outcome than a healthy adult, actually. You know? So there's some value, I think, to having flu shots for them. One concern people have is um, there is a preservative in the multi-dose flu shot, and that's mercury. Now, it's only in the multi-dose. A single dose won't have that because it doesn't need a preservative. Um, now, I have not seen enough data that mercury is linked to any childhood diseases. There's a talk um, that this might be uh, linked to autism. I really haven't seen enough data for that. So this is really not a big concern of mine. But then again, this is also not my specialty. And if someone has better research on this, I'd like to read it. But from all the data that I've seen, this is not a huge concern of mine. However, mercury certainly is also not good for us. It's a toxin, right? I mean, the less we have, the better of this stuff. So if you don't have to get it in your shot, then I would avoid it. And again, if you ask your um, physician to get the single dose shot, it will not have that in it. It'll still have an adjuvant like aluminum, but all of them have that. And we have to have that in these shots because you got to rattle the immune system, right? That certainly is also not great for us. But I think that's one of the things in a very small amount that unfortunately these shots need. Otherwise, they don't really work, right? So this is just a, an aside. So again, if you choose to um, have a flu shot this year, you can ask your uh, provider, I, hey, are you using a multi-shot or single shot? And you can ask for the single shot. There's many manufacturers for this usually, right? Topic number two. The FDA approves its, um, uh, sorry, the first over-the-counter Narcan, four milligrams, this is naloxone, nasal spray. And this is to treat people with opioid overdose. Now, I've been very critical of the FDA in, in many videos. I've, I think some of their behavior has been terrible over the last years. However, this is a decision I think that's very good um, because we have a huge, uh, really opioid pandemic going on right now. It's terrible. And um, what's going on with it is that, you know, we have about, 80,000 people dying every year from opioid overdoses. This is really concerning. This is a horrible, horrible um, statistic. And um, one thing that you know can be life-saving is giving this nasal spray and this Narcan or Naloxone. So if someone has an acute opioid overdose, what happens is they stop breathing. So the opioid, and we're talking about things like you know um, fentanyl, we're talking about Vicodin and Percocet, right? And there's many more. And when you take an opioid in a higher dose, um, then you pretty much stop breathing. It slows your respiratory rate. Usually, the way this works is we take a breath automatically, right? CO2 levels build up, and uh, at some point, we take a breath. We don't think about it. It's a brainstem function, right? But these opiates, they override that, and you just stop breathing, and people die of asphyxiation. So they just basically die of lack of oxygen. It's a terrible scenario. If you see someone in an acute overdose, this will reverse it. It'll you know, really block whatever effect the opioid has, and the person will be able to breathe again. So I think this can be life-saving to many people. I think um, this is not going to solve this um, huge crisis we're having right now in terms of these uh, opioid overdoses. But it's, I think it's a step in the right direction. Of course, it's not all out of the kindness of their hearts that they're approving this. Of course, there's, uh, you know, when you make something over the counter, you're going to have larger distribution. But in this case, I totally agree with the decision. I think it's great. All right, questions. Um, first question about the wine video I did. So I did a video um, that showed a study of women that drank two glasses a day of this uh, muscadine wine, non-alcoholic, and they had a significant improvement in skin elasticity and uh, retention of moisture in the skin. So the skin looked better, it was more elastic, and just from drinking this muscadine wine, two glasses a day for about six weeks. Now the question was, um, can you just eat the grapes, have the same effect? Can you drink the juice? Um, I don't have great answers to this. So obviously, um, the grapes will have um, these polyphenols in them. It's these specific polyphenols that muscadine grapes have that have these properties, right? My assumption is that when you have it in wine, it's more concentrated. So you will have, a, you know, you need a large amount of grapes to make a small amount of wine. 
I, I would assume that you would have a higher concentration there, but I'm not 100% sure. Would the juice work? Possibly as well. I mean, one thing to keep in mind, there's a lot of sugar in there. Again, if, you, if you're watching that, that's not a great thing to do, obviously. Um, but yeah, this was an interesting result. The second question was, can you just uh, drink the one, the muscadine wine that has alcohol? I'm assuming it has the same effect. However, keep in mind, alcohol is, of course, a diuretic. And so when it comes to um, water retention, at least in the skin, you might, you know, counteract some of those effects there. So don't know. Second question. Um, I did a video about um, exercise that showed in a study. Uh, it was actually a really, really good study. It showed less than five minutes a day of vigorous exercise can lower your chance to develop cancer by 30%. And um, this was published in JAMA Oncology. Now, people then, of course, asked, well, shouldn't you do more than five minutes? Sure. Yes, more is better. There's no question about it. However, I think the point of the study really was that even as little as five minutes can have a profound effect, right? And we're talking about vigorous exercise. We're talking about when you're done with this, you're drenched in sweat. Um, this could be like high intensity interval training, like, you know, doing sprints or uh, you can do this on the, on the bike, on a stationary bike. You can do, you can run, you can do stairs or all these things will work, right? But it's got to be vigorous, right? But the point is, you know, we used to always tell people, hey, listen, if you don't do at least 30 to 45 minutes of cardio, you might as well do it at all. You're not going to have any effect. And that certainly is not the case. And I think this discouraged a lot of people, including me, to do cardio regularly because we're like, oh, man, I don't have maybe half an hour today or 45 minutes. But five minutes, I think that's great that it has this tremendous effect. And I think when you do a high intensity training, like this high intensity interval training, you can condense um, your training in a very short time frame and get an amazing result from this. So I think this is very valuable because of that. If you have time to do more, by all means, do more, right? But if, if you only have five to 10 minutes on a particular day, hey, then you don't have to skip it. You just do it because you still know you're going to get a great result. So I think that is kind of the whole idea of the study, and I think it's very good. So it's definitely motivated me to uh, do cardio much more often.